Hello, everybody out there in the world. Uh, Mike Sullivan here. Welcome to part 15 of our COVID-19 updates um, that we've been doing. Um, it's been a whole series. Uh, I'm here today. Uh, you won't see him, but you'll hear him um, with uh, Dr. Eli Hendel, and he's an accomplished physician, and he is going to be doing most of the talking today. I'm going to do, be doing a lot of the listening today. I have both of our, uh, I'll tell you more about both of us. I have a, our contact information right up here, though. You want to jot it down where we're both open to any questions or comments um, or calls at, at the end of the process. So um, this is a, a part of a whole series of webinars that we've done. You know, I, I run a, a law firm doing primarily workers' comp defense. And we also, if you're listening to this, you're probably a subscriber to Sullivan on Comp, which is a, a publication um, about workers' comp law. And we in Sullivan Accompli conjunction with the law firm has put on this series of webinars. This is number 15 and this slide uh, and the next one show you this series of webinars that we've done so far. So we've talked about, you know, we did employment law stuff, reasonable accommodation. Um, then we got into workers comp. When do you provide a claim form? Um, when do you provide TD? When is it work related? You can go to the next slide, Doc. Um, psychiatric injuries, return to work. And we did all these things in conversation with Jake Jacobs Meyer. Doctor, you should, if you haven't heard that one, you should check it out because um, Jake actually was in a coma for three months and we interviewed him in depth about what happened uh, to him. It was really interesting. And then litigation, and we had some frequently asked questions. Um, and then the next one, um, and what, what we're gonna do today is, is on the medical side. I did wanna point out at the beginning that in addition to webinars, I've also written a book um, it's about 200 pages if you printed it. It's um, on COVID-19 and um, it's in depth on all legal issues. And it really can answer just about any question. It's online, it's always up to date. We update it every day, uh, just about. So uh, it's a pretty handy tool. And if you're listening to this, I'd recommend you download it and have it so you can take a look at it whenever you need to answer any questions about COVID-19. Um, so that's about it for the introductions. Uh, Dr. Andal, I'll, I'll let you uh, tell the world about um, about yourself, your, your background, qualifications a little bit, maybe, but that might be appropriate, and then just run with it. Well, I'm an internist by training, and I uh, did a fellowship in pulmonary medicine and sleep medicine, and I got uh, I took the boards in all three. Um, originally, I've been primarily a hospital-based doctor in a lot of critical care, and I've been a QME since the beginning of QME testing. I was an IME before that, and I've seen all the changes in the QME process. Um, and now I'm doing more medical legal stuff. Um, so um, this COVID, um, the way the COVID has changed our landscape is uh, affected our clinical practices. How will it affect the medical legal world is still a question mark. So I decided to present to the science behind COVID that hopefully will be helpful for everybody to understand what the legal ramifications are of this uh, dreaded disease. Well, that sounds fantastic. Looking forward to it. Watch this run with it and show us what you got. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin by trying to describe what is the infectivity rate and what the concept of the super spreader. As you know, uh, China has changed the initial, the official stand that the COVID did not start from one individual who ate a, uh, went to a live animal market and ate a pangolin that was bitten by a bat, but they said it was a super spreader. Now a super spreader is not an individual, a super spreader is an event. And um, South Korea had the first event when one individual went to church services and Korea went in February from 27 cases to 2,900 cases. Um, China, I think it was one time in Wuhan when 10,000 families shared a dinner for the Lunar New Year. So now I mentioned that because now we're about to enter what the consequences are of the, all these marches that we had for the previous two weeks. So let me illustrate to you what this concept is. The infectivity rate is measured by the number called the R0. And um, a number two means that one individual will infect two individuals and four and eight and so forth. Um, below one, there's no transmissibility. The, the uh, infective agent will die in the atmosphere. 
We're trying to get it to around one, which is manageable. And as you can see here, in Los Angeles, uh, California actually started at 3.7. And when we instituted the uh, measures, which was around here, we have come down to 1.0 in state until recently, that was a little jump. But to give you an illustration, New York, the R0 number has been nine. And uh, our doubling time was close to 26 to 30 days, which was excellent. We don't know what the ramifications are for the relaxations of the measures and all those demonstrations that we had of the time is a little a rise. And uh, to give you an illustration, if we stay the way we are by December, by the, the end of December of this year, 17% of the individuals in LA County are expected to be infected. 17 percent. 17 that's not a lot is that and, no uh if we go to one and a half if uh the r0 goes from 1.0 to one and a half we jump to 64 percent and if we go to the previous levels the 3.7 87 of the population will be exposed well now, uh, sorry, i don't understand what do you mean if we go to one and a half um if the r0 number the infectivity rate that's calculated by the doubling time, the number of new cases right. per day. Uh, right now we're at 1.0. If we go to 1.2, 1.5, I'm sorry, we go from expectations of 17% with a wide margin, you know, between 8 and 39, 42 to 77. So there will be a big difference if our infectivity rate rises. Huh. Well, that's and, that's interesting to me. So it's it's measured by the rate of infection the rate of uh new over cases time. and the rate of doubling time right okay so yeah the rate of doubling time so that would mean that really it's just a question of the speed of it that causes the percentage of infection but i mean it same the activity right. is the same number of people might be infected but it would be slower right uh, and, uh, each, each, so uh, we're, we're gonna get it then um uh, well ideally if we have enough people exposed, we get what they call herd immunity, except because of the mortality of COVID, it will be unacceptable to get there. So we want to get there with a vaccine, not with people getting infected, getting transmitted. Uh, okay. So we want to stretch it out like a, a piece of chewing gum um, long enough to get a vaccine. Right. Mm. So let me try to go back to basic science and describe you what a virus does. I don't know, based on what people have been asking me, I don't get the feeling people truly understand what a virus is, so let me explain here. Basically, this is a cell, and it has a nucleus and a cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is where all the functions of the cell are, and the nucleus, all it has is 46 chromosomes. Each one of them has a, something called DNA, which has two strands, and that has only four elements. Adenine, adenine uh, thymidine, guanosine, and cytosine. But let's call it A, T, G, and C. And the sequence yeah, of these. Yeah, I'm starting to get confused. <laughs> yeah, it is. But the, if the sequence of all of these is the framework of the individual, that is your, um, all your characteristics are determined by the, the sequence of all those in the DNA. Yeah, yeah, DNA. Everybody knows DNA, right? So the. Uh, the, uh, and each one pairs up, A pairs with T, and G pairs with C, and so forth. So each cell has a specialized function. So all the information of the 46 chromosomes are now relevant to the cell. So each cell, based on what it does, there is a region in that DNA that is relevant to that cell. And that opens up, and it's read by this thing called RNA. So it pairs up with A and T and G and C, and it takes that information to the outside and lays itself down. In each sequence of three, it's um, paired up with something called tRNA, which brings amino acids, and each one corresponds to a different amino acid, and that's how each cell builds a protein. So each cell does its function based on the information it got from the DNA, and that is the miracle of life. That is the basic unit of life. So what, what do you think would happen? What is a, what's a protein? The, a, each protein is a chain of amino acids, and each cell makes a different protein depending on what its function is. 
and um, each amino acid gets added according to what the information for the DNA is. And this is when things happen normally, in, uh, so, without any any jinx. So if I had a hair cell, like hair follicles on my head, which I'm subject, I'm very interested in. There will be a specific sequence for the Mike Sullivan characteristics, uh, whatever that is. What but kind what of protein would it build? Right. So what do you think would happen if there is a foreign agent that in, uh, intercepts the message and the orders of the commanding officer don't take place, only that message that the foreign agent brings? Or a foreign agent infiltrates the central command and it issues different orders that are not in the best interest of the cell, but the best interest of the foreign agent. And a different orders get issued. Well, that's what a virus does. A virus it replaces the RNA or replaces the DNA, and the cell does not what it's supposed to do, but does what it tells it to do. And there are some viruses that are DNA viruses, like a herpes virus and a moxivirus, and there's RNA virus, which is what the coronavirus is. So that's is all the viruses. Is, is virus a living organism? That is a good question, because if you consider that the cell is the basic unit of life, then a virus is not a living organism. A virus is a, um, a DNA molecule or RNA molecule. So it is not based on the classic definition of life. Hmm. Now, a bacteria, on the other hand, is a well, cell. Before, before you go into that, let me ask you. Um, so if it's not, then how does it? How can it function without the basic programming, programming uh, fun, uh, apparatus of, of life? How can because it do anything? Why it has to penetrate a host, a cell, where it lives of itself. It um, penetrates a cell and it tells the cell to do what the virus tells it to do, what the RNA virus or what the DNA virus cell tells, tells it to do. Now, all, not all, that's not always a bad thing. Because remember, every organism that penetrates a host doesn't want to kill the host. Because if you kill the host, you have no way of surviving. So viruses and even parasites live in balance with the host. This does a number of different things happens with this particular virus that I'll explain later that makes it not a stable situation. Mm, I see. Now, bacteria yeah, on the other side. How does the virus even know to go into the cell, though? That is, that is a miraculous question that I don't know how to answer. The virus cannot think. Yeah. It just goes according to predetermination. A bacteria, mm. on the other hand, is a cell, and it's capable of doing everything. It doesn't need to penetrate a host. Um, and they get together with other colony, other bacteria, they form colonies, and they get together with virus, with uh, parasites and fungi and have these things called biofilms which are cities with highways and elevators and they share nutrients and they're everywhere they're in doorknobs they're in bathrooms they're in uh, gyms and we are exposed to bacteria all the time and um, we are um, we don't isolate ourselves from bacteria we have antibiotics that can kill bacteria but we don't want to do that because bacteria are 80% of the cells in our bodies. Only, I don't know if you knew that, but in a human body, only 20% of the cells are human. 80% uh, of the really? cells are bacteria. We have a population of trillion bacteria in our, usually in our guts, in our skin, in our noses, in our, in our throat. They produce all the enzymes that make it possible for our body functions to occur. So we need them. Wow. So the, and they make they make a mucus layer that separates their population from us. There are some bad bacteria that make holes in this mucus layer and penetrate the gut. It's called leaky gut syndrome. Um, so the key to health care, health and disease is a balance between all the population of bacteria. So we take probiotics of the good bacteria, 60 or 80, 80 billion uh, cells. Um, Viruses. Just, I had no idea. I had no idea that bacteria were that problem. I knew we had a bunch of our guts and in our bodies that we were symbiotic with them. But I mean, are they in our arms and our legs and our head and everything? 
Yeah, they, that is the new area of research, the, the microbiome it's called, the, the entire population of bacteria and find out which are the good bacteria, which are the bad bacteria, how to make a uh, diagnosis of people's uh, uh, food sensitivities based on the gut bacteria. It's a whole new area of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of clinical uh, medicine. Wow. wow. Uh, a virus, really? on the other hand, is not a cell. That's all it is. It's a RNA, and this is, called, uh, this is coronavirus. Surrounds itself with a protein called a capsid, and surrounds itself with a lipid layer called an envelope. And this lipid layer can be dissolved with guess what? Soap. So then again, the best defense is washing your hands with soap. That kills the envelope, and the virus will die. Um, the now you like you said, can a virus live outside the cell? It just does not make any sense. However. Um, let me go here. The um, it has been discovered that co the COVID virus has uh, lived for five days in wood, five days in glass, and so forth. But that's only because they planted in a lab and they found it days later. There's no proof that they're really infected. They have shown that HIV, for example, found it in dried blood uh, outside a human organism, but it's also a very weak virus. Influenza, on the other hand, is more resilient. And if somebody sneezes, wipes his hand, and then wipes his hand on the table or whatever, and there's mucus cells, they have a flu virus that is capable of causing disease. But once the cell dies, the virus dies. So I think even the CDC downgraded the warning about the virus and inanimate objects. So it's people wearing gloves, and when they touch everything, it's an overkill. In fact, it is even more not a good idea when you wear gloves and you take stuff and you touch from one place and you take it somewhere else and then you take it home. So still, virus spreads by droplets. The average. Okay, I, got of, I got a couple of questions about this. So, so the viruses aren't necessarily alive. You know, when we say that they can't survive, does that mean that they just lose the ability to penetrate cells? That's what I'm. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. They found that the virus is they planted in a lab in one in a surface, and they found the same uh, RNA, for example, three days later. But they don't know whether this RNA is the capability of penetrating cells. Mm. But the same token, they've done random studies of going to public places, and they check right. for a place where people touch, like elevators or uh, doorknobs or whatever, and they hardly found any COVID virus. Well, would they find dead COVID virus bodies or would they find just no no virus? All they find is the RNA. The, uh, the present testing is that RNA. They do this oh, the I see. So like what, what, I, what you actually encounter is an infected cell, not just the, a virus. The virus, right. When, you know, you don't find the cell. Hmm. But that's how the virus is still alive when it's on a doorknob? It's in a cell or? No one knows. All I can tell you is what they know about HIV and influenza. Influenza survives when it's inside a mucous cell, but not okay. outside. Hmm. Okay. Now, viruses are important for a different reason. They uh, transfer genes between species and increase genetic diversity, and they're important, uh, important for survival of species. So, for example, um, dinosaurs are extinct uh, 60 million years ago. But we still have giant alligators and giant mammoth elephants, all because a lot of that information was preserved because of viruses. In fact, animals are the biggest reservoir of viruses, and that's what they think these corona, not only this COVID-2, but also SARS, came from animals. So coronavirus is an RNA virus. It's, only, it's a relatively small RNA, only 27,000 of those uh, Basis and encodes for many proteins, so it's a good adaptability. And there were seven coronaviruses that affect humans. The first four are don't cause disease; they just cause the common cold. They call the alpha cold, uh, coronas. And the third and the other three, the first one was called SARS. It started in Guangdong, China, in 2002. It lasted about eight months, and it scared the hell out of everybody. But look, only 8,000 cases and only 800 deaths. 
nothing compared to what this uh, uh, COVID-2 is. Ten years later, we had the Middle East uh, virus, which started in Saudi Arabia, and that had limited outbreaks. This one started in January of 2020, and it's, they did the, um, the genomic strand for the COVID-2, and it's 80% identical for the original of SARS. Wow. How did they stop SARS so effectively? They didn't. Um, that's kind of <laughs> spread among individuals. They started, as I will tell you later, this drug remdesivir, the only one against uh, a coronavirus, was started then. They started doing research, but they stopped the research when the SARS was not, was not a, a, such a dangerous uh, thing. Um, now, let me tell you something. There's been a lot of questions about this bio lab in China, in Wuhan, China. Um, bio labs do this thing called gain of function. They artificially enhance the pathogenicity and transmissibility of antigens um, to study their behavior and how to stop them. And we do the same thing. We have uh, bio labs here, and I discovered that there have been 24 reported accidents, 2,000 enough, so we have this agency that has a guidance and oversight and last i heard there's about 17 levels of security in those bio labs we have no such information from the wuhan uh, bio lab that's why a lot of people and myself included believe that this was more of a chernobyl situation because of the infectivity of this COVID virus huh. um, what does that mean does that mean that the chernobyl situation means it was a, it was a, a lab accident, and uh, they oh, wow. So they actually developed it, right? Because they do this thing called gain of function. This is what bio labs do, including ourselves. We do that too. Um, so this this uh, COVID two is so out of it's out of nature for the infectivity rate and the the way it mutates that mm -hmm. we believe that, that a lot of people believe that it was actually enhanced in a lab. It was um, an attempt uh, as part of a, prog a program to create biological weapons then. Right. right. Wow. And it, it, and That's it, really it, terrible. It, that you is, know, this agency called Bravda that was developed, um, the Dr. Bright, the uh, head of Bravda was fired by uh, President Trump because he criticized him about hydroxychloroquine and he's been used a lot. This agent, agency, Brav, that was created in 2006 under President uh, Bush um, for bioterrorism. Now, of course, it didn't have China in mind. He had uh, Syria and Iraq and Assad and all those things, but created those that agency to oversight bioterrorism. Now we're dealing with uh, something that came of a different lab. Wow. Wow. So this is what uh, COVID does. It looks like this. And um, it has these things called the spike proteins, which attach themselves to a human cell. And this is important because this is unique to this virus, and that is what they're using to develop the vaccine. The vaccine, so it doesn't get confused with other coronavirus, other cold viruses, is specifically designed against the S protein, the one with spikes. And the other important thing is that it selects uh, human cells that have this thing called the ACE receptor. The ACE receptor stands for the angiotensin converting enzyme, and that is important because the most commonly used drugs for hypertension, uh, ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, work on that ACE receptors. Lisinopril, and in my case, the one I prescribed the most is Losartan, work on the ACE receptor. It was learned that when Italy had all those uh, deaths, a lot of those people were taking those medications, and it was thought that taking those medications upregulates the receptor and makes it easier for the virus to penetrate, so those people are at a high risk. That is still a matter of debate. By the same token, children don't have well-developed base receptors, and it's one of the theories where children don't get as sick as adults. Yeah. And the third thing is that ACE receptors are common in the lower airways of the lungs, in the kidneys, in the gut, and in the arteries. And now we're seeing patients with strokes, with having large clots of people who never had heart disease and never had plaques, 
So we're starting to learn that the ACE receptor will determine where the virus will choose to affect the disease. Mm. So the virus enters, and as you know, the virus is not capable of doing anything except telling the, pro the cell to do what it tells it to do. It replicates the RNA, it tells the, the cell to make its envelope, its capsid envelope makes another virus, the virus leaves and finds another cell to infect. And that's how it leaves the DNA intact. It just works on the, on the RNA. One important thing to know, in order to replicate the RNA, it uses an enzyme called RNA polymerase. And that's our only defense against a virus. Remember, we cannot treat it with an antibiotic. They're not cells. But we have to develop medications that inhibit the enzyme that it needs. And remdesivir, the only drug against COVID, works against RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that it needs to replicate the RNA. What is that drug? Remdesivir. Remdesivir yeah. um, is the only antiviral drug against uh, COVID. I'll, I have a slide later that will show you what the latest study was done. It was, it was uh, allowed for compassionate use, emergency authorization only. Uh, and I just finished the, the uh, NIA just finished the study. I will talk about that later. But that okay. is the only antiviral drug available for this. I didn't even know there was one. Yeah. Does um, it work? Uh, does it work against all viruses, or is it just particularly this one? This because it has right. the enzyme. Hmm. So let me try to uh, contrast influenza. Okay. To, to tell you the difference between how viruses can cause disease. So influenza targets these cells that are, look like this, columnar, and they have this little hairy thing called cilia, which are important for our defenses. They clear your secretions, and they trap all the particles, and secrete the mucus, and they bring it up. And they're abundant here. So influenza affects the upper airways. But when these defenses are affected, so all the bacteria that are here, strep and staph, falls down to the lungs, and you get this pneumonia, that is what people die of, and particularly older people with lower defenses, people with COPD who don't have a good uh, clearance of secretions. So influenza affects the upper airways, but it's the bacteria that falls down that causes the pneumonia, that is what people die of. But uh. if this viral infection gets controlled here, everything is fine and you recover fast. So that's uh. I see. So it's actually the bacteria in the lungs that kill you, not the virus itself. The bacteria actually from the mouth and the throat that fall down to the lung is called aspiration, aspiration pneumonia. And the people who are more susceptible to pneumonia are the ones who die. Yes, the, bac the bacterial, the, uh, that's why the, the uh, vaccine is helpful to those people who are more at risk. Now, COVID, on the other hand, bypasses all this and goes straight here to the bottom. And that is because this is what the ACE receptors are. And when it does this, people don't feel symptoms. And um, <clears throat> it lodges itself here, attacks the cells of the alveoli. But one curious thing that happens is while all this is going on, people's oxygen falls down. And I, I read stories about doctors writing uh, anecdotes in the New York Times and so forth that they see oxygen saturation low. It normally is 96. We measure, when we get less than 90, we get scared and we give patients oxygen. Well, these people are having saturations in the 70s. And a doctor goes into the room and instead of a patient on the cell phone and nothing is happening. So patients go for days with low oxygen. And the reason I want to bring attention to you is because there are going to be consequences when uh, someone recovers from COVID and has gone so many days with low oxygen. And that's when I've had neurocognitive status. So the uh, when you talk about impairment, permanent impairment of a person who recovered from COVID, you have to take into account that this person has spent days with low oxygen and nobody knows. Now, this is what we do know for people in the hospital. What we don't know is what happens to people who have been quarantined at home <clears throat> without symptoms, and we don't know how long they've been without low oxygen. So this is unique with COVID. It goes insidiously all the way down and stays there. Let me show you this next slide. This is normal. This is the alveolus that is normal. 
and it's surrounded by a capillary, it works with blood, very thin space between them. So oxygen goes from here to there, and the blood, which is oxygenated, goes to the heart, and the heart pumps oxygenated blood, blood, uh, blood for the rest of the body. This is the normal. Now, when you have a foreign agent coming here, there's a lot of cells inside the alveolus. They are defense cells. They're called macrophages, lymphocytes, white cells, and they trap this foreign substance and they secrete other substances that trap other cells, and they control everything. So there's a little inflammation, it gets cleared. But when it persists, so then this inflammation continues and you have fluid leakage and you see the distance is a little longer, a little wider, and that's when oxygen doesn't get across. And that's how people start feeling having low oxygen without feeling symptoms until all hell breaks loose. And you have this, the whole deformity of the cell. And if you notice the pattern of COVID is that people go days without symptoms and suddenly they crash. And um, at this point, everything is deformed. There's no oxygen getting across. This whole thing is filled with fluid. And uh, we give it different names. This is, I'm old fashioned, this is the old name that we give them, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, or ARDS. These are new terms that I use, but essentially what it is, is the leakage of fluid outside the alveolus that interferes with oxygen. And the treatment is, you put them on a ventilator, you expand your alveoli, you make sure that oxygen gets across from there to the blood while you figure things out. To give you an, an illustration of how fast things can happen, um, this is uh, CAT scans. This is what radiologists call ground glass infiltrate. It looks fuzzy with airspace in, the, in between. And uh, this is another version. But look, only three days later, how fast things spread. So. That doesn't look good. <laughs> that doesn't look good either. <laughs> and it happened rather fast. And. Uh, yeah. So this is what we do. We put a tube inside the throat into the trachea, and this is connected to a machine, a ventilator. So we assure ourselves that a patient at least being ventilated. You know, we have very little threshold um, of when we intubate patients traditionally. We don't look at x-rays, we don't look, we don't go by blood tests. We simply go by the patient. It looks like he's struggling to breathe. We always rather intubate now. And later, we'll deal with an arrhythmia. If they have low blood pressure, we get fluids. And we, just, we sit calmly in the sun of antibiotic. But at least we will not have to struggle on an emergency basis and intubate the patient. So we always try to intubate the patient before things happen. So at least we're assured that he's not going to be struggling to breathe. This is normally with all cases of ARDS. But guess what happened? What? We discover shortly that patients who COVID were intubated did far worse than other patients who were intubated for other reasons. They the uh, usual mortality for patients with uh, ARDS for other reasons is 40 to 50 percent, but COVID people were dying at 80 percent. Does incubated mean that they are in ventilators? They were put in a in, in a in a tube into, connected to a ventilator. So you're saying that the if usually if you had to put someone on a ventilator for this problem with the lungs, ARDS, that they would live 40, 50% of the time. If but they, if the studies, the, 80, so the, mortality, the mortality data for ARDS is usually 40 to 50%. Yeah, but, they would die. But the mortality for COVID was much higher. Is so it actually like, beneficial to put incubate them? Well, intubate, remember intubation is not a treatment is life yeah. support. And you're trying to avoid an emergency situation when guys struggling to breathe. There's nothing more stressful. I've been there many times in my career. There's nothing more adrenaline secreting than trying to intubate a patient fast. You know, you got minutes. If you don't get it right, the patient will get uh, brain damage. And you're trying to put the tube in the right airway and the guy's biting and, and vomiting. He's got a thick tongue and you don't know where you're going. Oh, um, no, that so sounds really terrible. Thing. So you want to intubate a patient when you're calm and you don't have an emergency situation, but we're finding out that maybe we're doing more harm than good. And this happened, remember, all this happened fast. I mean, yeah, we've yeah. got kids that are in a, uh, 
all the ICUs were filled with people with respiratory distress. We're treating with traditional uh, means that we learn, and we're learning that, yeah, the tradition is not the right thing. And these are some explanations that came through. Remember those cells that I told you that are in the alveoli, that they are white, the defense cells, that secrete substances that attract other cells, and the whole inflammatory process takes place. Well, those substances are called cytokines. And this new term took place um, that what happens is a cytokine storm. And the patients who die from the intubator, from uh, being vent uh, on a ventilator, they don't die from the virus. They die from the cytokine storm, from the immune reaction to this uh, virus. So mm -hmm. we started to figure out those substances, those cytokines, and they all have these medications called biologicals that select those um, cytokines um, and uh, to hit those except not the virus. Um, IL-6 was the most commonly associated with COVID. It's IL sends what interleukin, there's IL-1, IL-5, IL there's about 20, 20 IL interleukins. Uh, tocilizumab is what we use in my hospital. This is a very famous one called tumor necrosis factor. It's in rheumatoid arthritis and these are the commonly used uh, injectable, sembrel, humira, this is for psoriasis. And the dendritic cells which propagate inflammation is inhibited by hydroxychloroquine. So as you can see, hydroxychloroquine doesn't do anything against the virus. It works against the inflammation resulting from the virus. So taking hydroxychloroquine without inflammation doesn't make any sense. And mm. yet people were doing that. They thought they were protecting themselves from the virus, but there's no evidence of that. This so, um, I'm confused. And does is incubating patients actually help them, or do they live more, keep them alive, uh, and is, is help with their successful recovery at all, or is it worse to do it? Well, the numbers are getting better there's, because there's less sick people going to the hospital. But this happened all at once, and the thought was, don't rush. And the thinking now is, don't rush too fast to incubate a patient like we commonly do. And mm -hmm. My theory is this, and, not, and that's not just me, this is what I hear a lot of people theorizing and I agree with them, is that the ventilators, by shoving air into an inflamed airway, you cause a, a barotrauma, pressure trauma, and propagate that inflammation that results in more cytokines. Um, so in my hospital, I've been proponent of different type of ventilators called pressure regulated ventilators, which don't just give you air, but then give you air until you reach certain pressure and it stops. It's a, an ongoing debate between those people who says hold off intubating at the risk that the patient will just struggling uh, in, in just poop out and then intubate him at the last minute. Those who say intubate him by use the pressure regulated ventilators. Some of these pressure ventilators can be given without intubating a patient, like those bypass machines. It's a it's a debate with a lot of people uh, showing evidence uh, on different sides, but people are collecting data from all, the, all over the world and coming up with numbers. But yes, that was the one of the theories that we're inducing this cytokine storm, we're propagating the cytokine storm by the pressure of the ventilators. Uh, I want to talk about this one. Dexamethasone has been lately in the news a lot. This is a very potent steroid. To show you how things have changed in the past weeks, uh, giving steroids to somebody with a viral infection or a fungal infection has been a no-no because steroids lower your defenses. And when somebody has sepsis in a fungal invasive fungal infection like candida or herpes, the last thing you want to do is lower those defenses with steroids. So mm -hmm. yeah, when people came with COVID, Nobody wanted to give steroids. Now there's data that people with decadron or dexamethasone were getting better. So now they're using steroids on patients who are intubated with uh, with COVID. And they're wow, using hydroxychloroquine. How long have they been doing that for? They, they're losing to look to lower the inflammation, yes. So again, yeah, the inflammation how long, is the how killer. How long have they been using steroids? Yeah, the inflammation is the killer. It is not the infection. <laughs> Right. How long have they been using steroids? How long has that been going on? Not very long. 
um, maybe weeks. Oh, wow. It, it, remember, all these changes have been taking place, uh, the, the guidelines have been changing by the week, uh, as I keep reading. Hmm. Um, the, uh, so let's talk about the immunity, since it's obviously not only what can kill you, but what may save you, if it works the right way, in the right way. Um, so there's two, there's the, the, the two, two arms. The first one is what you're born with. It's called the innate. And that's the first line of defense. Um, if this fails, then you have the second line, which is the adaptive or acquired immunity, and that is involving cells. The lymphocytes become B cells, which secrete antibodies, and the T cells, which cause the cellular um, uh, immunity. Um, the antibodies are good when the virus circulates around your body, and when the virus penetrates the cell, you need the cell, the cellular immunity. And these T cells differentiate into helper cells, suppressor cells, uh, killer cells, program death cells. So it's like when you get an invading force, you get air, uh, airborne division, amphibious assault, special ops. This is how these cells behave. And when these cells specialize in certain functions, they're also utilized for the treatment of diseases like cancer. There is a famous, uh, there's a drug called Trabizo for lung cancer that works on program death cells. So they can work for you if you recruit them for your own um, purposes, but they can also kill you if they work on a post. Hmm. How, uh, what's the difference between uh, innate immune and uh, acquired immune? How do you acquire immune systems? It is developed. It's called uh, acquired or adaptive. It's, it's developed in, um, as a result of differentiation of those T cells. In actual children, don't have a well-developed acquired immune system. That's why maybe the theory that they do better, because they just depend on the innate immune system, and they don't get the cytokine storm, the results from this, uh, this battle. Oh, I see. So as you go through life, your body develops defense systems in response to the environment. Yeah. Now, a, there was a lot of talk about vitamin D deficiency, and vitamin D, def D is necessary for the immune, innate immune system. So people with deficiency, we have a, a um, deficient in, innate immune system, and you go straight to the other ones. So mm -hmm. all these things we're learning as we go along. Um, so let's talk about testing, because you were asking that what, uh, earlier about uh, finding COVID and objects and stuff. Um, yeah. All they find is the RNA, and they use the process called PCR, which amplifies RNA a million times. So they can find it everywhere. What doesn't tell you is whether it's the live virus or it's a fragment of the RNA. So um, finding it uh, means to take the safe route, you self-isolate. The obvious the, uh, median uh, incubation period is five to seven days. So to be safe, they tell everybody, 14 days. Um, the, um, all of it depends on how it is obtained. Now, I tested myself, and in my hospital we have a center, and uh, they used the six-inch swab that goes deep into the nose. It goes so deep, you feel like it's almost scratching your brain, and it stays there for 15 seconds on both sides, and when we left, I was there in tears. So when it's done the right way, you're gonna get, if, if it's negative, it's negative. If it's positive, it's positive. But when it's done the wrong way, like you go to any doctor's office, you just put a swab in your throat, you may not get the right reading. You may get a lot of false negative. Wow. And, uh, you know in Dodger Stadium, when they were doing it there, they give you a box and you cough on it and they put the uh, swab in your throat. That is not adequate. So all of it depends, the accuracy depends on how it's collected. So there's a lot of false negatives, but very few false positives. So a lot of people walk around thinking that they're okay, but they may have it. Right. Especially since it's asymptomatic. Yeah. And spreading. But almost never do they get told they have COVID and they don't really have it. It's once it's, it's very sensitive if they find the RNA is there. Yeah. There's okay. a lot of talk about people wanting to test for antibodies, and they get a lot of calls from patients. They want to test the antibodies even though they were never symptomatic and they don't think they had the disease. I just want to know if I'm going to be safe. 
Well, having the antibodies doesn't mean you're safe, first of all. The virus doesn't discriminate between who has and who doesn't have. Having the antibody will make you uh, a, lot, a good initial defense, so you will not get us sick. The other thing about these testing is it doesn't give you the titers. It just gives you the, the fact whether you have them or not. Now, Mike, I've done a lot of reports for, I go to the desert in um, Bakersfield, and I see a lot of valley fever. And yeah. I, use those, I use those antibodies to determine two things. These are the two antibodies that are in the blood, IgM and IgG. There's a total of five. IgM comes fast, is the fastest, is the soonest, the one comes the earliest, it doesn't last long. So I use that one to determine when the person got infected and try to go back to his history, the 30 days, and determine whether I eat AOE, COE. IgG, you use the titers to determine how long the person stays on fluconazole for treatment. Now these tests that they have now don't tell you the titers. So they're not useful for that. They also don't last that long. So the importance is not the antibody. The importance is if you were exposed, the lymphocytes that created the antibody will have the memory. So if there's one statement that I want you to remember out of this whole mess that I'm trying to confuse <laughs> you with is this. Antibodies will come and go, but the lymphocytes that made the antibodies will always have the memory. Okay. And, uh, that is the key to developing the herd immunity. So if, if I can, um, could you go back to the slide for a second? Because I want to understand something. Um, let, me, let me see if I got this right. Antibodies are what your body produces when you have the virus. And right. so you can test for antibodies and it tells you whether or not you have the virus. And then you list all these different antibodies here and, and you point out that you know you might have one but not others. Uh, but the thing you really want to test for when you do an antibody test is lymphocytes. And does the antibody test? No. Lymphocytes? It's done in the lab is the greatest area of research, and I have a few slides on that. It is not uh -huh. commercially available, but that is really the key to understanding not only viral diseases, but also cancer, um, all inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, is the lymphocyte re the lymphocyte response? But we can't test for that right now. We can't test for that right now. No. Okay. I mean, you can, but it's not uh, commercially available. It's just too sophisticated. Okay. So let me ask you, just to make sure I understand, um, what's the difference between an antibody test and a molecular test that you have referred to here? Well, I don't know what you mean by molecular test. There's, well, it says uh, it. It says it on your second to the last bullet point. Molecular tests should be used. This one, antibody should not be solved diagnosis. Molecular test is the one that you test uh, for the viral RNA. That's the swab that I was talking about. Oh, okay, so you can either test to see if you have the virus or if you can test to see if you have the antibodies. You're saying the antibody test is not so good. It might not tell you. An antibody, yeah, right. Yeah. This is the FDA statement that I put there. Okay. Um, now, let me talk about herd immunity. You've heard of that term, herd immunity? I've heard the term, and, and I guess that means we're a big herd of people. I, I didn't really know. It sounds funny. Right. I don't know what it means. Herd immunity is what we want to get, what we would like to be, is when we have enough of the population that have been exposed to the virus and have developed immunity, so that protects those who have not. Oh, I why, see. because it doesn't get transmitted as much. It, right, and, um, and to, in order to achieve that, according to a WHO, you gotta have 50 to 67% of the population. And remember that first slide that I showed you, the R0 of one and a half will get us to 67%. Yeah. Except that to get there, we may have a very high mortality that is unacceptable. So we want to get that not by spreading it evenly, but by injections. You know, England, uh, Great Britain wanted to do that. And if you remember at the very beginning, they only put the uh, uh, distancing measures for the elderly. Everybody uh -huh. else was free to go and mix and they wanted to dilute the virus among the population and it backfired. 
Um, sweet. Wow, they just wanted to bite the bullet and and have right. enough to get infected so that they they get it over with. Uh, Sweden did that too, but the Swedes in general they're more cautious. And even though they did not have a mandate from the country, they did practice social distancing, so they have better numbers. Um, so uh, what we're about to see is what's going to happen to the emerging countries, all the Latin American countries that didn't have the resources or the ability, the sustainability of the economy to have those distances. And in Brazil, we're seeing numbers like 25,000 cases a day. Um, so. Um, we are going to see the uh, consequences of the emerging countries. We don't know the real numbers because they don't do the testing that we do here. Uh, yeah. Mexico, we're hearing a lot of bad stories that are coming from Mexico. Uh, um, wow. So, yeah, so this is a study done in Ireland, and this is to show you uh, your, the question you were having. This is the IgM, and within a week, it goes up. But it goes back to normal after two weeks. IgG, the second one that lasts longer, goes up here. And after four weeks, it comes down to normal. But look what happens when there is a reinfection, when there is a re-exposure or there is a vaccine. There's a much more brisk response. And that is the idea of that herd immunity, having enough people being exposed to it. So they have a much brisk response. Um, and remember what I said before, the cells have the memory. So it doesn't matter whether you have the antibodies or not, the cells have the memory and then it will be ready for the next time you get to be exposed. Right. Another study, that he, this was done in La Jolla in um, San Diego, but they found actually patients who were never exposed to uh, COVID develop antibodies and this is because the lymphocytes recognize the coronavirus from the common cold. So these uh -huh. cells being exposed to repeatedly to similar agents are very resilient and never able to adapt themselves, um, which brings into the point that the key to success is working in your immunity. Is what? Is working on those, uh, making those cells resilient enough so they can adapt themselves. So if you've had the viruses a lot, you are more resistant? That is the idea. Uh -huh. you, you want to have the population exposed to, so it's not a stranger. But at the same time, we're afraid of the mortality, so we have, we're doing the opposite. We're making sure that people are not exposed. So we're working <laughs> at nature. Um, yeah. And this is the vaccine. Um, there's two ways of making a vaccine. You either uh, use a virus, uh, attenuated or dead virus, and you stimulate the cells to secrete an antibody, and that will take longer time. So what they're doing oh, now yeah. is confidence. They, they're building artificially the RNA of the virus, and this is the section of the RNA that corresponds. Remember the spike protein that I showed you at the beginning? The yeah. So they, yeah. this is the area of the RNA that they're working on. Um, this company, Moderna, got a head start working with China in already in January, which again raises question. The Chinese knew more about this earlier. They knew that it was, was a serious thing before um, they decided to release it. Um, they added this thing called adjuvant, which is an oil-based material that also steers up those cells to develop antibodies, but can work against you. I don't know if you ever had that shingles shot, the new one called Shingrix. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, they add adjuvant, and some people have a very violent reaction to that shot, to the adjuvant, so it can work against you. The other thing is, this is what Dr. Fauci said initially. Nobody paid much attention to it because it got buried between the politics of the president and Dr. Fauci, but he cautioned against this. And this is a way that a vaccine can actually guide the virus to the cells. The vaccine actually made matters worse. It's called antibody-dependent enhancement. This happened with dengue vaccine, and you will only discover that when they have a longer trial, which we are, they're rushing this thing, and they may not have a longer phase three trial, and he cautioned against that, but nobody's paying attention to this. This is the present partnership, it's called Active. It's uh, four agencies, including Bravda, that I told you about your research, 
and a European agency. And there's that last offers about eight different companies in the private sector. This is the largest partnership to develop the vaccine. And the other thing that is unique is, um, let me show you this, is that they're setting up to build this, to mass produce the vaccine before it's even approved. The Gates Foundation has already founded for seven factories uh, to produce the vaccine. So this is unique, never seen before. It's like you building a house, spending a million dollars to build a house before the county gave you the permits to do it. <laughs> well, you got to get it up and running just in case they come up with something. I, how Can you give us any insight into like, the process and how long it takes to well, expect? Because here it is. Here's the answer. Okay. This is how everything gets approved. Uh, phase one is uh, done for safety, it's usually done in animals, and you test how high you can go without getting into problems. Phase two, you gotta show that you have, you will do more than nothing, more than placebo. And it's efficacy, but you still don't know how efficacious. So you usually use a small number of healthy volunteers. And then once you pass phase two, then you go to the largest one, which is phase three, where you lose the, uh, people with the higher population, including the elderly, those with lower immunity, and you test in natural disease condition, not in the lab. This is the So I guess one. you're gonna lose some people at every phase, really. I mean, some people are gonna- This one, and there's ethical considerations here, because remember, you're comparing people with the agent with those with placebo. And nobody right. knows who's getting what because that's what's called double blind. But in order for you to succeed, a lot of people with the placebo have to get sick or even die, which is not nice if you're one of the placebo persons. So uh -huh. every and that has been an issue, for instance, when they developed the, the polio vaccine. Um, a lot of things have been written about uh, a lot of people got polio who did not know they were getting the placebo. Um, so that's why every study that has been done has a scientist, a statistician, and it's got an ethicist. Because everything that is, um, they, they have a research a committee in every institution, like when I was in training, and you gotta go through them to make sure that they approve it. Uh, there's, you know, there's ethical considerations when you do this. Uh, these well, studies. I mean, and the state, but it's, it's intensified by high, how high the stakes are and how fast Exactly. How much it means to have a vaccine faster, sooner rather than later? There, there's a lot of political pressure to rush through this. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, how long will it take? Uh, how long will it take? I do not see it uh, more than a year, more than next year. I cannot see possibly mm -hmm. doing it. at least another year. Yeah. At least another year from now. Well, maybe at the beginning of next year. As soon as possible, as soon as possible. Yeah, but maybe longer. Maybe never. No, we will have a vaccine. Well, uh, they don't have one for HIV, right? So I mean, maybe they. HIV, we never had a vaccine because HIV we got on good antivirals. This is what this slide is. Oh. Remember, anti. You cannot use antibiotics against viruses because they're not cells. So you select what their enzymes are that they need to replicate, then you create these medications against them. Uh, influenza has these two, hemagglutinin, neuraminidis, or H and N. So there's H1 and 1, H3 and 4, whatever. And there's this drug, Tamiflu, which works beautifully five days of that and stops the uh, infection. Um, HIV uses reverse transcriptase. It's actually called a retrovirus. It starts as RNA, develops the DNA. And this is the first one, ACT uh, retrovir, and they had a whole bunch of them in cocktails, uh, so they control the virus with this. And this is the only enzyme against coronavirus, and this is the only medication, remdesivir. Um, they tried this cocktail on um, Cori, it did not, it worked in the Petri dish, it did not work on, um, on humans, and this is the only one. Um, as I told you, they started they, with the SARS and uh, the US Army had a partnership with Gilead, the company against Ebola, it didn't work. They had all these trials, not a very good uh, result. In the US, it's been used with compassionate use under emergency authorization, it's still not approved. And these are the two trial, large trials, one in China and one here. This is Dr. Fauci's agency. 
and they had a thousand patients in 47 sites. It just ended two weeks ago. But look at the results. Not the eight percent of the people who took Remdesivir died, and eleven percent of the placebo. So not much difference. It did not mm -hmm. reduce mortality. Yeah. What it did, but it did reduce is the time to recovery, eleven days as opposed to fifteen days. So it's not a Man, miracle. That's so fast to even have a drug to test. It uh, they rushed it through because everybody was demanding. It. You know, they they thought it's the only. It makes scientific sense. It's the only. Uh, RNA polymerase uh, inhibitor, the only way to hit the virus. But uh, results are not very encouraging. Mm -hmm. But this is a good slide. This is uh, influenza over the years. It has been as low as, uh, I think, uh, 6 million, as high as 40 million per year. But no matter how many cases, look how few hospitalizations and even deaths. It's been staying steadily. Um, well, now, it's just the, it's just the flu. I mean, actually, I can't read it. The slide's too small for me. Well, it is influenza. It is the flu, and yeah. um, even though people do die of the flu, but the proportion has been really small. And we had the vaccine, but remember, each vaccine is only twenty-seven percent effective. It just oh, gets this year strain based on last year, um, but even the people who were not vaccinated did not get us sick. And this is once again what I told you about the lymphocytes being constantly re-exposed to variants of the same thing so they get resilient. I like to call this slide good immunity is like cross training. If you do, if you work out and use the same cardio machine all the time and you do the weights the exact same way, your muscles get used to it. So you don't get results. But if you change, you do cross training, you do different machines and you do the weights different ways, your body adapts itself. So it's more. Uh, resilient. The same thing with immunity. And this okay. is the best example of herd immunity. Um, you get exposed to it enough times and um, you will adapt yourself. Um, this is uh, why people are scared of uh, being too quick to stop. This is what happened in 1918. Well, let me ask you something. That last slide you were looking at, that, that was just, I, I want to make sure I understood, that's just a common flu and cold, right? Well, not the cold. Influenza. That's flu. flu. Okay, influenza. The flu, and the flu can be quite dramatic. You know, the problem with people calling the flu is I have so many patients tell me, I just got over the stomach flu, the little flu, the nose flu. If you have influenza, you know it. You're on bed and you cannot move. Now, oh. you can be sick in your stomach, you can have a cold, and that's a virus, but it's not influenza. And uh, I have a lot of Spanish patients, and they tell me el resfrio, you know, el catarro, la nariz. It, and they call it a flu, but it's not the flu. Um, having, a, uh, having a coronavirus, coronavirus. Flu is quite serious. And they measure, and there's a rapid flu test in the throat. But the important thing is we kept the mortality low, and this is because we've been re-exposed to it some day every year. Is um, is coronavirus a type of influenza? No, coronavirus, coronavirus, influenza is influenza virus. They're both RNA viruses. Mm. Coronavirus is called like that because of the uh, crown around it, the membrane with these proteins. So there's about seven of them, but influenza is not one of them. There's influenza, paroinfluenza, and there's a different types of the influenza viruses. But look what happened in uh, 1918, there was such a high mortality and um, there was a big resurgence in the fall. I don't think this is applicable now. In 1918, we just came out of World War I and there were millions of people, young people in the trenches with meningitis and, and rats and all that stuff. But we are gonna have another resurgence. I just hope it's not as bad as this one. Well, wait a minute. There was three, well, you just said something that I didn't like. <laughs> you said we are going to have another resurgence, and, we are. And, and and so tell me, this is what happened with the in 1918. There was three, well, three. Uh, there were, I guess the first one's not a resurgence, right? But no, then there were the first two and a resurgence is just a, a big jump forward in the number of cases. Right. Well, this is deaths. This is not even cases. Uh. So the 
the number of people dying in the fall was much higher than the initial one. Right, but that's just a percentage of the people that have it. So it would correspond, I would imagine. But you just said we're going to have another resurgence. And oh, yeah. Explain and that. Especially, and especially now that we had all these issues with the streets, with all the people next to each other, that's a super spreader. I hope I'm wrong, but I think we will. Okay. Is so that based go- on things like the history? You're, I mean, you're saying, is that is that based on our events currently or is that based on just the history of how viruses act in a society it's well we use it we use in 1918 as an example but we already seen a jump now we see a jump in every country that would lower their uh, the restrictions um so this is um what i'm basing it on but this is what the projections are they, they're saying that there will be a combination of influenza and, and uh, corona. And influenza will weaken people even further to develop more serious than corona. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. That's terrible news. I hate to hear that. I know. I mean, just as we're getting ready to pick up and go back to normal. Um, so this is an injured worker, and the, a lot of talk is about the healthcare worker. And this is me. This is That's you? Uh, this is me doing a bronchoscopy. And this wow, is the, all dressed up. This is the Atmos. This is the helmet. We only have a few of them. Right now we have the shield. But I am actually more concerned not about the healthcare workers, but uh, police uh, cops. They, unlike healthcare workers, they go in a control environment with PPEs and they go to a room that has uh, um, negative pressure. They're exposed to people on a spur of the moment, and um, people who don't know they are. Um, I've seen a fair number of correctional officers who tell me that the inmates, um, they know that the best defense is biting a person. <laughs> and there's a lot of claims we made, you know, got bitten by an inmate, and then you got Epstein-Barr virus and so forth. Um, and they have these fancy uniforms. I personally think they should wear a, a jumpsuit or a cheap clothing that they change in the locker room and they spray it with aerosolized uh, peroxide, which was what we use in the hospital. So we recycle N95 masks with uh, peroxide. So I think they should do that, but then that's me. But um, uh, the first question, you've been through that, and I, I don't think we need to talk about this the AOE, COE. Yeah, um, I got a recent question about, just to throw something in there, about um, the, the Senate bill that's coming out of committee, and it, it really just is a, a photocopy in this latest form of, of the governor's executive order. Mm-hmm. And it would last through July 6th, I think. Yeah. So let's we'll see. All right, and this is, I've been asked a lot, the criteria for return to work, and these are the guidelines. The CDC is rather skimpy, and I don't agree with it. They say three days, three days from resolution of fever and respiratory symptoms. I think it should be 10 days, and I require two negative tests. Why, this, why do you think it should be 10 days? Yeah. Uh, CDC, but that's CDC in paper. OSHA is much better, and there's a lot more to it, and I urge you to look at their site. I like particularly the fact that they have engineering controls, um, filters, and ventilation rays. This is something that I have addressed when I've done reports on something called sick building syndrome, which results from too many people in a room with not a good efficient HVAC system. So there's this number called the ACE, the air changes per, um, ACH, air changes per hour. And a typical office building uh, has six. Um, a hospital, is 12 and an operating room is 25. So it's every two minutes just about air changes. Believe it or not, a nightclub and a bar, 20. So that's I can have so many people fit into close quarters. So yeah. they're gonna have more engineering controls about uh, this. They also have this thing called uh, um, ultraviolet uh, light um, that uh, kills uh, mold. Um, and um, they're talking about um, rotating shifts to avoid overcrowding. 
Um, and another interesting thing, a new addition to the job description is exposure risk. I look at job description when I'm asked about readiness to return to work, and I look at two things, the essential duties and the occasional duties. Uh, so for instance, a cop, um, and if it's essential duties, including uh, be ready for an altercation with a per perpetrator, um, you start thinking an older a captain or a lieutenant who's uh, got atrial fibrillation and he's thinking eloquence as a relto. So you start thinking, can he redo that job? So it so happens that the job gets changed, and someone who does administrative work, so it's not doesn't have to, so altercation is not part of essential duties. But I looked a lot at at the uh, job description. Firefighters, uh, most of them do primarily uh, medical calls. And a guy tells me with respiratory disease, only done one fire a month. But if that's an essential duty, you raise question about readiness to return to work. Now we're going to be looking at also very high exposure risk, high risk or moderate risk as part of the job description. Yeah, um, that's only the OSHA uh, guidelines. So what can we expect about the consequences of COVID in individuals? Like I said, the dust has not settled. We don't, we don't know enough. But so the best thing I can show you is what a study is done on patients with similar conditions. And this is ARDS for other reasons. And there are psychological uh, consequences, long-term consequences. Um, diffusion is the ability of oxygen to get across from the air to the blood. And there's abnormalities in that. Um, this is SARS. This is articles done on patients who have recovered from SARS in Hong Kong and Toronto. A lot of psychological PTSD and pulmonary consequences of patients who have recovered from all the respiratory infection. This is a very good test, six minute walk. How many meters you can walk in six minutes? Unfortunately, is not analogized anywhere in the AMA guides. The uh, AMA guides uh, table 5-12 uses uh, VO2, oxygen consumption, which is a very sophisticated test, cardiopulmonary exercise test. It's not done in many places. I wish they had something that it could use this. Chronic fatigue syndrome, good luck defining that, but you can expect a lot of claims dealing with that. Well, I haven't seen that since the 1990s in workers' comp. Everyone right. used to have chronic fatigue syndrome, and I've never, I've never seen it after the 1990s. It became fibromyalgia. Yeah, so it, and this is the what we know about the long terms of influenza. Interestingly, we've seen um, inflammation in the brain. This is an area affecting the emotions and the short term memory. Um, we have changes in the CAT scan with fibrosis. And this is um, the new thing of a COVID. As I told you, we have people. Well, with can I, I'm sorry, but can I go back to one slide? Um, this is really interesting to me because, oh, but this isn't, this is influenza. This isn't COVID, right? This is influenza, yes. Patients uh, will actually have the influenza, not a cold, the actual not flu. A cold. <laughs> not a stomach ache. All right, because I was wondering about the long-term effects of, uh, of COVID, but that's, this slide doesn't speak to that. Yeah, the best I could do is show you what the other similar conditions we know about and we can expect yeah. the COVID. Are people going to get permanently hurt from COVID? It seems like, because the idea seems to be like, oh, it's a flu, so you don't die, you get over it. Well, this is one example of what we have ahead. Let me tell you what we do know. Okay. We, we do know that there are patients who have those clots in those arteries. Causing, right. uh, this test, the dimer, we use it to diagnose pulmonary embolus. Normally, it's 2.5. Somebody comes to the emergency room with chest pain, low oxygen, and just was in a long trip to the Philippines, set 12 hours on a plane. We know he's got a setup for a blood clot. And if it's above 2.5, we treat him for embolus. Well, these guys in COVID had D dimer of 1,000, with the net which nobody has ever heard. So these people are going to have to stay in anticoagulants for life. Um, this Kawasaki-like disease that happened in children, you're not going to be dealing with it in New York. It's an autoimmune condition that is rare. Um, so you're not going to be seeing that in, uh, in uh, workers. And this is what we do know. They have loss of taste. The, again, the effects of all these days that they went through with low oxygen, 
Um, we are going to have um, cognitive. Uh, oh, you only need a few minutes with lack of oxygen for brain cells to be dying. Yeah, I know that can be really bad. Do you, this loss of taste or persistent weakness is this like a permanent thing or is it just? I don't know. This is what we do know now. And it's, mm. it's, it's a lot of this is subjective. I wouldn't expect that to get better. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I just wondering about permanent disability in, in COVID cases. Well, that's, I guess you, did you address that already in one of your talks that that's um, COVID? We did. Well, what we talked about in our webinars were, um, you know, it, it, workers' comp is not, deaths are not subject to apportionment. Right. So if there's any causal link, between um, work-related condition and, and not whether, if non-industrial COVID complicates an industrial condition and causes death, it's compensable and vice versa. If industrial COVID complicates non-industrial or industrial COVID complicates, yeah, either way. <laughs> if there's any causal connection um, between a work-related injury in combination with COVID, work-related or not, then the you know, death is compensable. Yeah, well, all I wanted to add to this is that alert you don't try to use a death certificate as a legal document either for or against people have been filling out their certificates for 30 years and i can tell you we always do take the easy way you got the mortuary there to pick up the body you have a family all ang anxious and pissed off and they got funeral arrangements that the last thing you want in that one is the coroner to raise questions and to cancel things so we always do the most generic non-controversial stuff respiratory okay. failure secondary to atherosclerotic disease secondary to heart failure whatever if we put infection of any kind that may raise that may delay things so chances are nobody's going to write covid uh under death certificate but the same okay. token there's a lot of people dying at home without being tested they die from heart attacks and strokes Whereas before, traditionally, an ambulance gets called and the patient is dead, they always brought it to the ER and the doctor pronounces them. And now, because of COVID, they don't bring them to the ER, and these um, MTs are actually filling the death certificate. So don't go by that. Uh, but like I said, the, I do not see any way that someone can argue that as absent the COVID, with this person ended up having a complication that resulted in his death. It's going to be really easy to prove that COVID had some contribution. At least oh, yeah. Time. Yeah, they had COVID and they died of something like this. It's going to be, uh, I wouldn't want to be the defense attorney on that case. <laughs> and this is what I would use to evaluate a, a injured worker. As for me as a pulmonologist, I will insist on a CAT scan and a full pulmonary function testing with diffusion capacity, use this table. Uh, neurocognitive testing uh, using these tables. This is going to be an in interesting issue. Testing for immune function. And I have been requested to do that before. What is that? What is that? Well, I, I had claims uh, a person exposed to mold, for example, and then claims since that exposure, and there's no objective evidence of any permanent impairment. Pulmonary functions are normal, CAT scans are normal. A sinus x-ray, maybe some mucosal thickening, but uh, no blockage. Uh, but claims I'm getting a lot of infections, I'm weaker, so my immune system is not working. So I researched and I got my immune, a, immune function panel, which includes measuring, remember, the, there's the antibodies and the cells. So I measure the antibodies, those five antibodies. In the Quest Laboratories, there's a lymphocyte panel number five that looks at five different lymphocytes, helper cells, suppressor cells, and the white cell count. And these are the only tables you can analogize to. That's a WBC table. So I use that to determine any objective measures of impairment. But that, will, that may not stop people. I've seen a patient going for a naturopathic doctor who tests these esoteric tests, and aflatoxin is an example associated with the mitochondrial function. So the patient says, well, my mitochondria are not getting enough oxygen. Well, I looked into the website of the American uh, Academy of Allergy and Immunology, the American College of Asthma, Allergy and Immunology, I found nothing there. But you can expect claims to evoke 
this. Um, and as far as who can deal with this, my only answer, when I was asked if a person wanted to be seen by specialists, I'm bound by the American Board of Medical Specialties and my section is an American Board of Internal Medicine, whose only both of subspecialties, allergy and immunology. Um, this is chronic fatigue. It is part of the, this is the sleep table um, in which not only sleepiness, but fatigue affects the um, sleepiness. Uh, the take home impairment of ability to um, uh, affect a, a daily living, activities of daily living. And regards to treatment, it's going to be a question. What does a COVID survivor um, put in need for treatment? There is no treatment. You don't give either one of these to someone who doesn't have acute disease. But yeah. you're going to have patients with comorbid conditions. They're going to have to be weaned off prednisone in the biologicals. If they have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, they may get flare ups. And that has got to be taken into account. You have to monitor comorbidities like COPD. Someone with already diseased lung to begin with, and he's got COVID on top of it, you're going to have a worsening uh, of this pre existing condition, aggravation of a pre existing condition, to say the least. You got to monitor the very closely. The oximeter, the oximetry is also oximeter is cheap. They're less than a hundred dollars. And I'm recommending all my patients who are on oxygen, patients with COPD, and uh, I have a few COVID, not many, all of them to get one of these and measure the oximeters at home. And then bring me in a whole number of and a paper whole number of measurements. But yes, every COVID survivor should get one of these. And again, those patients who had the high D dimer are going to have the going to stay on anticoagulants for life, and that in itself is an impairment. It appears uh, affects your ability to do certain jobs that involve trauma. Mm -hmm. And the last slide that I have is fortunately in internal medicine we give have objective measures for severity of disease, and this is some of them: the PC scores for pulmonary embolus the NIH stroke severity scale, and we use that to analogize to a percentage of impairment in the AMA guides. I use these a lot, the, the GINA for asthma and the GOAL for COPD. Neuropsych, I don't know, but you're gonna need a good neurocognitive person uh, to evaluate the consequences of the long-term uh, oxygen uh, uh, walking with the low oxygen. Yeah. Um, and last two slides are philosophical. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this. Yeah, that was an amazing book. And that book predicted everything that is going on right now. <laughs> yeah, but I can't remember what it predicted that it hasn't happened yet. It happened in a little town in Algiers where he lived. Oh, where yeah. it was um, the plague, which is caused by uh, Pastorella pestis, which goes through mice. And there was a plague that affected millions of people died. And now uh, how it affected this little town, this one doctor who predict, who tried to warn people, and now uh, the people looked at him with suspicion, and the authorities uh, they restricted the town. It's a very interesting story, very similar to what's going on now. Yeah, it's a tale of human nature, which isn't good. At least <laughs> this one isn't good. <laughs> yeah, I remember that kind of from school. Well, I hope it, I just hope, gosh, it's so weird, isn't it? It's just a weird thing. Yeah. Interesting times. Yeah, yeah, that's the old curse, right? May you live in interesting times. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, why don't you give us the last slide? Give me one more slide. The slide. No, there's <laughs> one more. There's one more, it's got our sign off slide. Uh, Promise. No. Nope. Uh, see, I told you. <laughs> we always well, like to do. Thank you, Mike, for giving me the opportunity to talk a very complicated subject. I hope you got something out of this. No, you know what? That was a very complete exposition. I learned a hell of a lot, and I think it's really timely and needed. So, thanks for showing up and, and doing. It. I know you give this speech a lot, but getting it out to our audience is it's just going to help the industry. So, we appreciate it. You certainly have a lot of expertise. This is our information. Um, if you have any questions or comments for me or the doctor, shoot us an email, give us a call. We're always happy to um, 
to answer any questions. We appreciate, appreciate any feedback. But that being said, we're out of time. I want to thank the doctor. Thank you all for listening. And we'll sign off. We'll talk to you next week.